Hello, everyone. Let me pull in Bunny too quickly. <sighs> All right, we are going to be looking at a review of the Dawn of Everything by a channel only slightly smaller than mine called What is Politics? They have made it a long-standing project, apparently, to go through every chapter. So we're going to go through every chapter of their review. We'll probably just get through uh, chapter one tonight. And now we wait. I'll try calling one more time. Oh, in the meantime, hello, Waxwing. Hello, Win. It looks like I'm going to be debating Wolduka at some point in the next month on international relations theory. Whether it's bunk, I will be taking the affirmative. Or something along those lines. Hello? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, there you go. Couldn't hear you for a second. How are you? Oh, that's weird. I'm, uh, all right. Are we, uh, live? Uh, we are indeed. Oh, hello, everybody. Hopefully everyone is well. I was just, uh, reading through a bit of the book so I can, you know. Just very, very quickly, the, uh... very quickly reviewing the 700-page yeah. book in advance of Yes, yes, seven hundred, all seven hundred pages. No, just chapter one. You'll be less rusty than me. It's been a little bit longer since I read chapter one. We have both read chapter one. It's just been a yes, while. Yes, and it was interesting. It was interesting. It was. Uh, we've chatted about this before. In fact, we, we, I can't remember any of the details, but we actually looked at this a little bit privately, um, in advance of this stream, about like a couple months, I think. Um. I think a month. About a month? It's a blur. Yeah. Um, I, I think my, my general frustrations with this book so far, and I don't actually have a lot of them. I think it's overall pretty good. Um, it's 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 sort of like the inverse of uh, Fukuyama. Um, it's, it's taking on, like, a lot of his presumptions. It's sort of feeling them, or, or feeling uh, basically a contrary position as a critique. So Fukuyama is sort of insistent on the ubiquity of the state form, whereas Graeber and Wengro are going to do something similar to what um, uh, James C. Scott does, where he's like, well, no, there, there, there are other little things like statelets and non-state communities, all these sorts of things. They're like all these different little like political possibilities that people are, are playing around with. Um, we'll, we'll get into that in a moment. I have some issues with it, but it's, it's, it's overall like the data is good. I have some. I, I find the political theory itself a little bit questionable sometimes, but the the book as a whole is is actually so far pretty informative, and it's it's worth it overall. I don't know if Absolutely. I can really. I don't know if I can really say that about Fukuyama by contrast, although he seems to have gotten a little less. I have not read any of Fukuyama, um, and now that you say that, I'm actually interested to read Fukuyama <laughs> to see how this compares. Uh, Fukuyama. There was one book by Fukuyama I heard about, which sounded interesting. Origins of Political Sorry, Order, by chance? Uh, no, it was not. And no, it was not the end of history, um, one that everyone talks about. Let me look it up real quick. It was, I think... Uh, Political Order and Political Decay, or...? It was Our Post-Human Future, Consequences of the Biotech... Uh, Biotechnology revolution. 
Oh, that's like the that's got a white cover, I think. Yes. Yeah. Of course, you remember it by its covers. I see that's what that's what you judge books by. It has exactly. a bunch of babies on it. I don't remember you that know, part because it's biotechnology. As I saw I saw Fukuyama on the title, and I I was in a rush. I was like, pass. I'm not gonna look at this, but I know it exists. I just know it's a it's a yeah. whitish bar on the shelf. Anyways, I'll uh, I'll share my screen and we'll just begin. Awesome. Let me actually check the chat real quick. Just want to see what people are saying. You sound almost as asleep I like as I am. That. I'm barely. Uh, no, right I don't. Now. I don't know. I I like. I think it may be like. Um, actually, before we start this, let me just get some water real quick. Yeah, by all I... means. If if you're feeling under the weather, don't feel like you need to like. No, it's not. Anything. It's not a. It's definitely not like a sickness thing. I think I just haven't been drinking enough water today. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, I'm good. Oh, this copy of Capital is like getting worn out even without being opened. What the hell? It's like they make these things disintegrate. Hello, Charlie. <sighs> what else do we have here? Stepping to change in an accelerating world. You know what would be a fun stream? I should go over um Jordan Peterson's maps of meaning. I'm sure that's gonna be an absolute disaster. Exactly, new dawn time. Okay, I am back. Let's do this shit. All right, let's go. Feeling better? Yeah, absolutely. Good. Chad, is uh, is Bunny Tooth audible? It better be. Oh no, is this a bad faith interpretation of Graber and Wengro? I am not sure. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm. Is that the right one? Is it, it's it's ten point. It's ten point two. two, but he did them out of order because he was reading the uh, chapters uh, before the book released. So this is actually the first chapter. So this is Farewell to Humanity's Childhood. Okay, um, cool. Yeah. All right. Okay, let's go. Hello, fellow kids. Okay, quick. Whose intro is better? Mine or his? His, for sure. All right. I'm, I'm going to continue this review alone. Sorry, guys. And welcome back to What is Politics, and to our critique of Greyburn Wengrow's new book. Oh, I really don't like Dawn this uh, Star Trek outfit. Today... Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where he's where he's going with that, but it's like it's a lib critique already. Today, in this third installment of our critique, we'll be circuitously covering Chapter One from the book, which is called "Farewell to Humanity's Childhood," or why this is not a book about the origins of inequality. Before I dig in, I want to outline where I'm coming from and why I'm spending so much time and energy criticizing this particular book. I don't destroy my income spending insane amounts of time making podcasts about political theory because I like blathering on about abstractions and I like not having any money. I do it because in politics, like in any field, bad political theory leads to bad political instincts, which means doomed political actions. 
If you're a doctor and you don't understand how germs work or how the human body works, you'll treat illnesses with leeches and mercury and hysterectomies, and you will harm your patients instead of helping them. And if you're a human being engaging in political action and you don't understand how human beings work, you're going to build social movements that hamper your objectives instead of advancing them. I don't like this characterization right off the bat. First of all, it gives the impression that there is some sort of like settled stance on political theory in all these different categories, and there's just not. Um, what there are is are a bunch of open questions that people are interrogating either well or badly, and generally they're doing it worse and worse in proportion to the, the certainty they apply to any of like the, the, the categories they're playing, um, unless they're very historically particular. And that's actually, I do have one of the issues, um, that is an issue I do have with uh, Graeber's book as well as with James E. Scott's that we reviewed with um, with St. Andrewism. Um I'm not liking that he's approaching it from that angle to begin with. You're going to write laws that can't be enforced, or that produce the opposite effect to what you're trying to achieve. You're going to be easily seduced by bad ideas, and by people who don't share your interests, and by charismatic idiots and charlatans who don't really have any ideas. And, if your goal is to change the world in major ways, you're going to end up making revolutions that fail, or else that succeed, but then end up replicating the same types of hierarchies to the ones that you're trying to overcome in the first place. Now, in a society with a hierarchical power structure, where some people have power and freedom at the expense of other people's power and freedom, be it capitalism, the Soviet Union, medieval Europe, or ancient Babylonia, one would always expect that the political theories and concepts coming out of the main institutions in these societies will be confused and convoluted, particularly when it comes to understanding the most basic features of these societies, how power is structured, how power works. For example, if you took a course on Marxism at one of the top Soviet universities in the 1970s... That's also uh, some language I'm not particularly fond of how power works. Like that, that's a very vague notion right off the bat. I don't, I don't understand precisely what somebody is telling me when they're explaining to me how power works. Like, what are they referring to? You were going to be taking one of the most boring. Work? Well, it's like they're talking about the force. Like, I don't know what that means. And you'll, you'll see it in like, like titles of books all the time. It's like politics and power, a theoretical approach, or something like that. I don't know what that refers to. I've got a I've got a gift copy of Machiavelli's The Prince that for some reason has the subtitle. It's just the William K. Marriott uh, translation that you find in f like low cost hardcovers all over the place, but it's like um cause it's I, th I think it's uh, public domain, but it has like Machiavelli's The Prince on the art of power, which is not from the book at all. It's like I don't I don't know what this is saying. I think it I think it may be well maybe this is just me assuming, but I think that I think they may be meaning it in like a Foucauldian way. And I think this the reason why they say it like that and why it's kind of like the force is because at least within like Foucault's thought, the only like universal is power. It's just a question of how um I guess power is like structured and like orchestrated and blah blah um in society, which is where we get into particulars. But considering that in that sentence in this part um, what is politics is discussing a multitude of societies. The only, like, the only, um, again, the only universal is power, which is why we have this whole, like, power discussion. That's at least how I see it. I don't really know. Maybe. I, I don't know. I... We'll just, we'll just continue. I am, I'm just, that's, that's, that's already, like, a red flag for me, though. Mind-numbing classes imaginable. And that's because if Marx's work had been taught in a straightforward and easy-to-understand manner, students would immediately recognize that the ruling party needed to be overthrown and that the workers should take power directly. And it's the exact same reason that Christianity gets such mangled interpretations well, in the medieval well, Catholic well, Church. That. Yeah, that sounded weird. Did you want to? Did you want to comment on that? I just wanted to say, like, well, even if that's like, I don't actually, I don't really know what the point of this necessarily is. Um, okay, like, I don't know if exactly if it's bad political theory, especially considering that, well, let's be honest here, most of the political theory that we're teaching is not just, you know, from hierarchical societies, but oftentimes um, informs and sustains those societies. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're bad. Um, I would actually be really interested to see what is good non-hierarchical uh, political theory, as in I don't even know what political theory there is that doesn't come from a hier hierarchical society. Um, 
Yeah, like, I'm 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 you know? I don't know what he means by political in this case. Let me actually just pull up his channel quickly. Um another I problem maybe, I had is that I want to see if he has whole... something on that. A political definition is... of shape reality. Yeah, it's like the whole idea that oh the reason why they it's bad theory is because if it was good like so for example in the case of the USSR they would they, you know they would like fuck over the USSR which I mean you know what uh, in some ways I, I guess but at the same time you especially if you're teaching these people you kind of need like the theory to be in some way useful yeah um, you, you know what you have, like, hang, hang on hang it. on hang on a second yeah. um he has a he has a video that's actually shorter than this one. It's 37 minutes long, called How Political Definitions Shape Reality. Maybe that would actually be worth going over. Yeah, what I mean, that will probably be more your wheelhouse. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not the political theorist person, but I can probably say something, a thing or two on it. Uh, no, let's let's run through this a little bit, and then we'll... No, how, how, long, how long is it? It's 38 minutes long, but this one's like an hour and 10. So... Oh. No, yeah, it's fine if, if you want to go over it. I mean... I feel like that one might be a little bit more helpful because it'll give us sort of a primer to figure out what he's saying because he's he's deploying stuff here sort of in a similar way as I would, but I'm not familiar with this usage, so it's a little bit odd. Okay, so let's, yeah, let's go through. Okay, you're still got, you still got the, uh, you can still see this, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, crystal clear. All right. Greetings, fellow dum-dums, and welcome kind of back to annoying. What is Politics. I was where our ultimate goal is to figure out how we, as ordinary people, can achieve our political goals, even though we don't have any official decision-making authority. Before we can achieve our goals, though, we need to know what those goals are. And before we can do that, that, that we need idea. to know what words mean. Because, as we saw in the first episode, political terms are a cesspool of meaningless words. Words that everyone uses without really knowing what they mean. Which makes us more confused, more powerless, and easier to manipulate. In the second episode, we saw that although journalists and academia talk about politics as if it's just about decision-making involving the state, that the word politics actually refers to decision-making in any kind of group, whether it's a state, no, it or whether it's you and your boss and your co-workers, or you and your friends, okay, yep. or you and a Bad. bunch of fellow chimpanzees. Where's he getting that from? Oh no. That's kind of oh, like no. a very common thing that people say. You know who, no, you know who says it? Who? This is this is a, a almost a direct quote from Faber. What do we mean by politics? The concept is extremely broad and includes every kind of independent leadership activity. We can speak of the foreign exchange policies of the banks, the interest rate policy of the Reichsbank, the politics of a trade union in a strike. We can speak of educational policy in a town or village community, the policies of the board of management of an association, and even of the political maneuverings politique of a shrewd wife seeking to influence her husband. Needless to say, this care. concept is far too broad for us to consider this evening. I'm looking at uh, Max Weber's politics as a vocation lecture. Yeah, Need for a second there, I thought you were actually—I thought you were like reciting that from memory. I was like, "Holy shit, the fuck!" <laughs> no, I'm not that. I'm not that smart. Needless to say, this concept is far. I mean, I did. I did have it on hand, so I'm not that bad. But needless to say, this concept is far too broad for us to consider this evening. Today, we shall consider only the leadership or the exercise of leader of influence, rather, on the leadership of a political organization. In other words, a state. And here, uh, there's a there's a footnote that's uh, instructive here. Politik in German means both politics and policy. Here again, the choice of word is termed politics. So he's he's basically just parroting Weber, and he, he's essentializing that notion, which you should never do. So I I hate this already because I know what's going to happen. It's he's basically going to treat Weber's political science as a textbook, more like a Bible, and it's bad, which is frustrating because that's precisely what Wengro and Graeber do, and what James C. Scott does, and what Fukuyama does, and that's why I have a problem with them. So, um, he brings up uh, chimpanzees. Wait, was it chimpanzees? That's a, that's a chimpanzee, no, I'm pretty sure. I, I'm not that great at primatology. Well, why the hell are you I, on here? You, 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 you come on here, you <laughs> fake your, you fake your monkey identifying credentials. What the hell? Not a monkey, it's an Abe. Okay, you just showed that you do not know <laughs> your privatology. Um, either way, uh, yeah, chimpanzees, like, I think it's pretty obvious. I don't really want, not to say, like, um, there's not anything to say about, uh, like, them being inferior or anything like that, but, um, simply they don't have a lot of the qualities, um, that humans have that make our 
forms of organization, you know, what they are, right? Like, you, I don't, I don't think it's even if you, even like, even if you wanted to make a term that meant like, that was, I guess, like sort of his conception of politics, it wouldn't really be the, all that useful because it would lose a lot of, um, what makes what's like essential to our quote unquote politics. But yeah, let's just continue. Well, just just to cap that off, I mean, he's he's lost his field at this juncture. <laughs> like, what's he speaking to? What is politics? Well, politics is just decision making. Okay, so good questions answered. You can stop the channel now. It's decision making. Hey, so now we just figure out how we make decisions. It's great. Great. It's really weird because if you sorry if we're focusing too much on this. No, but no, like, no. It's fine. Take your time. It makes it to it makes it to where politics basically becomes a lot of other things like you can say politics is is art um or politics is gaming like gaming is politics well, more you make to the decisions point, while you're in a game more, more to the point like it means that when you describe something as political you're describing nothing because every human activity at some level involves decisions more or less so it's like exactly that's what i was, yeah, that's what I was saying because we are yeah, but, I, but i said it better bunny tooth that's the important thing why well, i brought up gaming so Oh, well, that as if that works in your favor. Let's keep going. Is <laughs> that you found? And we divided politics into public politics, meaning decision making involving the state, and private politics, meaning every other kind of decision making groups. In the third episode, we saw that most human societies over the past twelve thousand years or so have been organized into political hierarchies, where some people have more decision making power, more wealth, and more rights than other people. And we saw that hierarchies serve three related purposes. They facilitate efficient group cooperation, they facilitate conflict avoidance, and they also facilitate the exploitation of less powerful members of a hierarchy by more powerful members of that hierarchy. And then we saw that what the left-right political spectrum is all about is where one stands in regards to these hierarchies. If you support the interests of the people on top of a given hierarchy, then you're on the right of that issue. And if you support the people at the bottom, then you're on the left. In short, the left-right political spectrum is about hierarchy versus equality, i.e. about class conflict. I don't agree with that at all. Okay, I mean, this like, is, this is, this is not good. This is not good. I can actually see why um, they may have an issue with the book, because the book is extremely historically particular, which I like. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big, you know, I love his, being historically particular. I think it's way more fun and way more truthful um or really more useful but yeah this is this well the, is the, the main the main problem is that he's he's assuming right off the bat um an essential relationship between uh hierarchy and uh i guess i guess i guess the, the use of hierarchy and the cause of hierarchy so he's assuming that it goes in the direction of hierarchy is useful therefore that's why hierarchy comes about not um the the hierarchy itself is primarily what makes use of that arrangement um i i don't know how on earth he he gets to uh like there there are there are there are left-wingers who are very pro the state um particularly famous right. yeah. subset of them were French. So it's like... Not even just that. It, it makes it seem as if, like, at least, especially this picture kind of goes... Ag or maybe it's just, like, an example, but it kind of it kind of goes against, like, um, their point, because their point was that your right, your right wing, if you're for, like, the people at the, at the top, mm -hmm. um, but, of course, at the time right because it's by time so if you were advocating for a whole new class let's say like i was advocating for you know uh what is it called like techno feudal lords that aren't currently like ruling if i advocate for them am i now left wing let's let this run for a little bit more we're not going to go through the whole thing i i'm, I'm already like getting a strong sense of where he's yeah, going to yeah, mess yeah. up here conflict between the different ranks in our various political, economic, cultural, and international hierarchies. 
In today's episode, we're going to continue talking about left and right, but this time with the goal of illustrating the power that definitions have in shaping our perceptions. And in doing so, we're also going to explain the criteria that we use, and that I use in this podcast, when I'm evaluating how to define all of these ill-defined political words. Words don't inherently mean anything. They're just social conventions. They're communication tools. But even if definitions of words can't be objectively right or wrong, they can be right or wrong in practical terms, in the sense of whether or not they do their job communicating the ideas that we want to convey. Uh-huh. So when we're choosing definitions for words, there's some criteria that we use, which I call the four C's. That, that's, that's circular. We'll, we'll go back to the, the review. I, I, get, I get the gist of this, right? I want to listen to his philosophy of words, or verbs as he calls them. Worbs. Worbs. We're going to be taking yeah, one saying, of the most boring. Yeah, singing the same thing. Yeah. Um, well, we answered our question. He's he's basically just essentializing uh, the variant notions of politics, which again, like, are, are descriptions of of the use of terms, not a prescription for how we ought to be using this language, or how we ought to understand states generally. I mean, Weber's got some problems too, but like, it, it's it's the misuse of him here that's frustrating. It's not well, a Bible. One quick, yeah, one quick thing on that video. I don't know if you saw, but did that video have? I don't, I don't want you to go back, but does that video have like any sources? Like I'm wondering. No, let's take a look. That's actually a good question. Yeah, like what? Let's mm-hmm. see. If... They're just social. Shh, shh, shh. Here, let's take a look. It's got a transcript. Yeah, a full transcript. Yeah, okay, there we go. Check that shit out. All right, let's like that shit. Um, is that all he's got? Looks like it. I think so. Damn. That doesn't bode well. Hmm. A political definition shape reality. Nope. Not a. Nothing? Damn. Come on. No citations, no footnotes. I'm not seeing okay. brackets. Yeah, that's not great. I'm not happy about that. That's not, yeah, it's not good. No, no, it's not. Okay, well, for anybody out there that's going to start a it would always a channel or political video and or whatever, please up. put your source as it helps. You know, like, uh, like I do, like I do in the description of all of my videos, I put like an exhaustive list of all of my sources because I'm diligent and I take the time to do that. That was a lie. I don't do that at all. Let's keep going. Out of the main institutions in these societies. Well, you like do streams. That's a little bit different. Yeah, fair. Well, and and in in my defense, like when I do the video essays, I usually have like a thing at the end where I just sort of show like, here's some further reading you can do. So you get a sense of where I'm coming from with this. Yeah, so try to do that. I mean, even in streams, it's nice if you just say, like, preface, or not, or you can say preface, or, like, at the end of it, or whatever the fuck it's called. You can say, like, hey, if you want to learn more about this, you know, I've done that a couple times, but... Um, well, it's like, yeah. it just give some indication of where you're coming from. Like, I, I, I know this off the top of my head, so, like, I can I can get where he's pulling this from when he says politics is just decision-making in groups or something. It's like, I've, I've read Faber backwards and forwards, so I know. But... If it's something like anything else, or if you're talking to an audience that hasn't, it's like, come on, I, I need to know where this is coming from. Otherwise, it's not actually telling me anything because I don't know what this statement is standing upon. You'll be confused yeah. and convoluted, particularly when it comes to understanding the most basic features of these societies, how power, I feel less bad about how power works. For example, if you took a course on Marxism at one of the top Soviet universities in the 1970s, you were going to be taking one of the most boring, mind-numbing classes imaginable. And that's because if Marx's work had been taught in a straightforward and easy-to-understand manner, students would immediately recognize that the ruling party needed to be overthrown and that the workers should take power directly. And it's the exact same reason that Christianity gets such mangled oh interpretations. Oh my god, I'm sorry, that just makes me cringe so much. Yeah, I, I gotta tell you, I, I, I read Marx directly in, in college, and I... I didn't get that impulse. Um, well, not just that, but you also you're not just taught Marx, right? Like you're also taught other Marxist thinkers because you know Marxism is a well, as it's considered, it's a science, right? It's a it's, it's a breathing, living discourse. Let's 
It's going to go into Christianity here. I want to see what he's going to say about this. Medieval Catholic Church, which Jesus probably would not have been a big fan of. Today, in the rich industrialized countries, we have a political culture where none of the basic... I don't, I don't get what the point of that was. The point is basically that hierarchical societies, even they utilize ide political like ideologies um, and make and basically convert them into like this sort of boring like dogmatic soup um, that everyone can drink to justify their system rather than giving like the full truth of it. In this case, like Marx wouldn't have been for the Soviet Union. Uh, Jesus Christ wouldn't have been for Catholicism. No, I got that. I just don't know why he's saying it. Terms of uh, our political uh, vocabulary yeah. have any consensus we'll definitions. <laughs> so terms like left and right, the market, socialism, capitalism, these mean something different to each person who uses them. And we just kind of feel what they mean. People with poli-sci PhDs write entire books about these topics without defining them or even really knowing what they're talking about. Terms like politics and government are routinely used in ways that obscure power by hiding the fact that politics and government exist in the private sphere, not just in the public state sphere. So people think that they love democracy and they hate top-down government, but they don't notice that when we go to work, we're spending most of our waking hours subjected to a top-down government where the dictator is the owner. Yeah, but it's in the private sphere. Like the, There's an argument to be had there, but that's a substantially different thing. You, you can be in favor of authoritarianism in the workplace and still be a Democrat. With only our bargaining power and the state as a check on the owner's power. And then we have all of these stupefying ideologies, ideologies that make us stupid, these myths that obscure the nature of power. Take contracts, for example. Contracts are supposed to be the foundation of our economic system. And the ideology of contracts is all based on this total falsehood that you will learn in every single law school, that contracts represent the will of the parties who sign the contract. Therefore, every contract is a win-win situation. But in the real world, your will is only expressed to the extent that you have bargaining power. Like if you've ever paid way more in rent than you can afford because the market is a nightmare and you have no other choice, you know that your lease contract reflects 95% of your landlord's wishes and about 5% of your wishes. And much of that 5% is actually only there because of the law. For example, your landlord's obligation to keep the place in livable order is only there because the law makes it an implicit part of every contract. I haven't been to law school, but this doesn't seem like something that would be taught in law. It seems, it seems like, I don't know. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I don't necessarily have any principled opposition to this, like, my first Marxist theory here, but it's, it's, I don't know. Although getting that enforced is another thing. All of this bad theory doesn't just confuse or pacify people who accept dominant ideologies and ideas. It also clogs up the minds of those of us who reject them with disastrous consequences. One of the most spectacular examples of this is the English Peasants' Revolt of 1381, which I talked about in episode 8. After the Black Plague killed off half of the population of England... See, look, the thing you just said, not the, not the Peasants' Revolt thing, the thing you just said about just, like, onboarding ideologies, like... He, he literally just regurgitates Weber without any justification. Um, does, doesn't even pay attention to the fact that the only reason why you can even make that equivocation is because of uh, similar word usage in German, specifically. Like, it's... it's... Like, come on, man. The peasant class suddenly had much more bargaining power than they had had before. And over the course of the next 40 years, the peasants and local priests who understood that their position had changed, proselytized and organized and clashed with the nobility and state authorities, leading up to the astonishing events of 1381, when an army of 100,000 organized peasants basically overthrew the nobility. And then the peasant army marched up to the castle of King Richard II. But instead of chucking him into the river and declaring the republic of libertarian socialist Christian communes that they'd been dreaming of for the previous 40 years which they could have easily done because his troops were away fighting some foolish war in France. Instead, they shook his greasy 14-year-old pubescent hand, and they cheered him when he signed charters agreeing to abolish the nobility and all of their other demands. And then they went home with big smiles on their faces, only to get slaughtered in their beds by the king's troops when they came back from France, which anyone who understood feudalism would have predicted. 
The peasants, as intelligent and well-organized as they were, did not understand the structure of their political system. They did not understand that the king's material interests were such that he would almost certainly side with the nobility against the peasants. Despite having rejected much of the ideologies of their day, and having built up their own egalitarian vision of Christianity, they still believed in one of the most pernicious political mythologies of the Middle Ages, that the king was a divinely appointed monarch who cared about his people. Another more recent example of a situation where you had mass organization. I'm, I'm by sorry, like, I'm, see, this is, this is the problem with not having sources, because if you had a source, I could, like, look at that source and be like, okay, this is whatever. But the fact that you don't, I'm already, like, especially with, I don't know, it just sounds a bit too simple for it to be true. Maybe, like, there is some truth to this. I don't really well, know, but, I mean, like, like, I think... Even I even in the, the whole, phrasing, like, like, return, like Christianity or whatever. I don't know what the hell that you, was. Even even in the framing of like like monarchs or kings or whatever as being like materialists, because you know they they know what's really up. It's like that's that's not necessarily true. Just because they were brutal and willing to like do unethical things to hold on to power or to get what they wanted done, that doesn't mean they weren't, for example, like deeply religious. I mean, which just seems kind of obvious. Like, there are a lot of, like, deeply religious people today who are extraordinarily cynical and callous about human lives um, and are massive hypocrites about, like, the, the, the stuff that is, like, said in their own holy books about, you know, caring for the poor and loving your neighbor and things like that. Like, there's, there's not a... There's, there's no contradiction here. Just because somebody is in power doesn't mean that they're secretly a Marxist just with an evil twist. It's like, I know... I, I, it's, all, it's all just... It's all just material, guys. Mm. Like it's it's not. It doesn't. It's no. Yeah, like, yeah, you, like you need Biden something. Is, is secretly a Marxist. Uh, Sirius says, "Prison Sunday." I just checked the description. It seems like he has sources. I just don't think it gives direct numbered citations in the video. Do, do you mean for like? Oh, there's a bibliography here. Yeah. That okay. This one does cool. All right. Let's let's look at this. Yeah, I really want to see that, cause I'm I've never, may, okay, I don't really know. I, I wish I knew way more about medieval history, cause it's so fucking fascinating. Okay, here but, we um, go. So, not. bibliography suggested readings. The Peasant Revolt. The Ernian Birth Book. What? Okay. Um, the Bright Day of Summer, the Peasant Revolt of 1381. Original audio version. Can I be honest? Okay, well, the... Can I be yeah, honest? Sure. This, this is something that makes me a little bit sus suspicious off, off the bat, and I, I don't necessarily think this person deserves my suspicion, but this is just my innate response. When your sources are basically on a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio with the things they're supporting, it makes me think you're regurgitating the sources and you're not actually doing any surrounding background work to like frame them or, or to vet them you know like yeah um yeah especially considering that these are only about the revolt um i don't i don't know at the end of the day i'll check these out but yeah. i just have yeah, a if you if you want to check these out um you don't have to check it out now but uh, let us know what your I findings want, I'll are check it out. yeah i'll check one, it out like yeah for the next one but um yeah, it just seems very. It just seemed like very sus. Maybe this is true. It just seems like. I don't know. Like there probably was a lot of other aspects that played into that decision the peasants made. Um. And well, like, also, like we have to keep in mind how how much of their this you know ideology that they had, whatever it was. It probably wasn't libertarian socialism, considering that libertarian socialism didn't exist then. Um, but like, it's like they're communalist, like not in a bookshin sense, but you know, generally. Well, what uh, you generally ideology. what you would generally want is you would want uh, a thing that gives like the the history uh, by itself, and then you would want something else that substantiates that particular contextualization of it. If they're both in the same thing. Then you'd want to follow the sources, and you want to see like if if like the things that the article writer is is saying jive with the claim that's being made, because it's literally just here's the thing for the peasant revolt. Um, 
I, I guess there's two, but that's that's just not that's not great. You know. We'll uh, see. I mean, I it know. was to be fair, it was like a, it was only a short part, but yeah, um, we're not even in like the dawn of everything yet. It's just it's. Let's there's... let's just get to yeah. Let's just get to the dawn of everything, but. Yeah, there's just there's so that, much kind of us. there's well just so many gaps and like he he wants to critique like the sloppy political theory of of other theorists but he doesn't seem to be doing any extra diligence himself so i'm kind of just despite having rejected much of the ideologies of their day and having built up their own egalitarian vision of christianity they still believed in one of the most pernicious political mythologies of the middle ages that the king was a divinely appointed monarch who cared about his people. Another more recent example of a situation where you had mass organization, bolstered by favorable conditions, all wasted by bad theory, is Occupy Wall Street, which just had its 10th anniversary. And of course I'm bringing up Occupy because one of the big intellectual lights behind Occupy's spectacular successes and its mindless failure was none other than David Graeber himself, co-author of The Dawn of Everything. So on one hand, Occupy was an incredible success. It mobilized an unheard of number of people for weeks on end, camping out in over 2,200 parks in over 1,300 cities and towns across the world. Its slogan, We Are the 99%, which was Graeber's idea, reintroduced class conflict into mainstream political... I don't know, that's interesting. ...discourse for the first time in 70 years. In its aftermath, it inspired a reinvigorated socialist movement that had become more or less dead even before the fall of the Soviet Union in 1989. Occupy articulated an explicit rebuke to finance capitalism, as well as an explicit rejection of corrupt representative democracy and authoritarian socialism. And instead, it espoused and adopted deep democratic decision-making forms inspired by the historical libertarian socialist slash anarchist movements. Polls show that Occupy had the support of the overwhelming majority of the people in most of the countries where they mobilized, which is something unheard of for a movement with such a radical message and ideology. And authorities were secretly afraid of them. It received very little media attention at the time, but the Obama administration shelved some pro-Wall Street lizard reforms that they were going to implement for fear of incurring the wrath of the occupiers and their admirers. And just the fact that they were able to illegally occupy so many parks for so long in violation of the law shows that in the right circumstances, organized people can be stronger than the state despite all of its police and nukes and tanks. All of this success was a huge surprise to even the organizers. And once it got going, many Occupy participants with roots in working class organizing wanted to take advantage of what they understood was going to be a short window of leverage that they'd have before the whole thing would get shut down in order to put forth one overwhelmingly popular demand. This was seen as something that would generate a win-win situation. If the government would actually buckle and make concessions, this would embolden the movement and set a precedent. I have to confess, I was in like year one political science when this was going on. I, I have no, I have no memory of the particulars of Occupy. I would, I would actually be interested to uh, look at his sources on this one. Like it, it seems very specific. I, it, it seems to be particularly relevant to Graeber. I had no idea he had such a hand in the. The uh, development of the the slogans and the stuff about that. He did. He even wrote a. He even wrote two books on it. I'm pretty sure. Really. Yeah. Um, be... There's. I believe it was direct action, um, an ethnography, and I don't know the other one. Was it the Democracy Project or? I think it's the Democracy Project. Yeah. Okay. Like, imagine that every time the government did something that an overwhelming number of people opposed. Uh, President Snyder, do you think you could talk to this guy? He's a pretty small YouTuber. He might be willing to speak to you. Yeah, I'd talk to this guy. Bunny Tooth, could you talk pretty to this sure guy? Uh, pretty sure we're already planning to. Were we? I, I don't have any immediate plans. I would like to. I, 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 well, to, to do the Dawn of Everything um, book uh, stream, we wanted to have Sandra brought up what is politics, which is why we're even watching what is politics. This is true, but I don't think we actually arranged to talk to him directly. We we should though. I'm I'm definitely on board with that. I think he yeah, he, he, he suggested it. it. He suggested it. I don't think there were any immediate plans though. I I have certainly not reached out to this guy, but I'll I'll reach out to him. I'm I'm a little bit curious. Yeah. Hell, if anybody he, uh, uh, if anybody uh, in the chat actually, I don't know what time zone he's in, but if anybody in the chat wants to try and reach out to him, um, I'd even have him on tonight. Or they didn't do something that an overwhelming that majority of people wanted. No, that people course. would just rush out to occupy everything until the government buckled. And then people got what they demanded, or at least some concession towards it. 
And if the demands got rejected, well then the whole world would see that our political systems are so corrupt and undemocratic that even when 99% of the population wants something, our supposed representatives do nothing except send the police to come in and beat us up, which would lead to more radicalism and a higher level of general consciousness. And some of the demands that they were considering were things like ending corporate personhood, implementing a universal jobs program, and getting money out of politics, which I think would have been the winner, as it had, and still has, upwards of 90% support even among self-described conservatives in the United States. But the people who initially organized Occupy Wall Street were largely upper-middle-class kids coming out of expensive universities. And coming from comfortable backgrounds on the whole, they were more interested in their theories and identities than in actually achieving anything. Like they thought that making demands of the government would somehow taint their movement and legitimize the authority of the state. Which is like, imagine if someone is invading your apartment and instead of demanding that they drop your things and get the hell out or else you're going to go club them with a bat, you pretend that they're not there and you have a jerk-off festival with your roommates. Making demands is exercising your power. But to the initial Occupy organizers, it was seen as quite the opposite. They saw making demands as somehow giving up their power. To quote Graeber, who at the time was one of the big proponents of the no demands ideology. I think that the problem of asking for demands is that, who are you demanding them of? You're in a sense saying to the people in power, we would like you to do things differently. Do something for us. Save the whales. But who's going to save the whales? I'm not going to save the whales. I guess they're going to go out and save the whales. But ultimately, the idea of protest is you're saying, you people in power are doing this wrong, and we want you to do something. And even if that something is step aside, you're addressing them directly. Oh, hey, Bruce. Oh, no. Addressing them directly. That causes anarcho cooties. Now, the issue, of course, wasn't saving the whales. It was oh, bailing out homeowners. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. I think there is, like, a necessity for demands, but at the end of the day, they're not... They're just simply, like, the problem with a lot of these is that they're simply not going to do it. And I think that actually, this is where a demand could be useful, because even though you demand it, they won't ever do it. So, for example, like, um, like defund the police, or, like, straight up abolish the police, or abolish prisons, they won't fucking do that shit. Why would they do that? Why would they? Why would they do any of those things? Why would they have? Like they wouldn't have. Like any, everything that was brought up, or even Graver brings up in debt. Um, uh, his proposition was to, uh, basically just, what is it? When you relieve all debt, basically you say like all debt doesn't exist anymore. I forgot what the term is. Um, uh, that like it's just they it's wouldn't just, fucking it's just do debt that forgive, shit. It's just debt forgiveness. Or, oh, debt forgiveness. There we go. Or a jubilee, um, I guess. Yeah, jubilee. Um, they wouldn't do that shit. Maybe like on some small scale, person like little cases here and there. But they wouldn't fucking do that shit. Of course they wouldn't. So, no, I think it's. I think there's actually like quite a truth to this. Um, because at the end of the day, what people need to like, what we're kind of taught always in this system, is. Um, go cry to the authorities about it, and then they'll like, ch and then they'll change and do something. Fuck that shit, because you give them, you giving them the power in that case. The point is that you need to give yourself power and express your own, and that's by, you know, I don't exactly agree how this is particularly done, but I think we're going the right way here. Like you need to that's... um create your own. You know, that being said, I, I am not I am not read on this, so I, I am not a competent commentator on this issue in particular. But it also didn't work for a reason, and I think the point that's being made here is that like if if, if Occupy Wall Street was indeed aimed primarily to fostering a sense of uh I don't know, class solidarity or something like that, just just creating awareness of, of the political power of, of something with the strict aim simply of getting an awareness of your numbers, like we are the 99% as a slogan. I could see that. The problem though is that because it was, uh, because demands weren't treated as, we're not making demands, not, not because uh, that's not the aim of these demonstrations, but because these are ineffectual, therefore what we're actually doing are demands by other means. Um, it had nowhere to go and had a totally dispersed inertia. So it was... Yeah, that, that's what I would agree with, yeah. It does need to have... 
a so like, like like Brooke, Brooks here yeah. is saying, um, and I actually agree with this. Uh, it ended up being a huge waste and only served to jade a generation, and it's true. Like a lot of people came away from that with the distinct impression that protest as such or demonstrations as such don't work, and they do. The problem was that uh, what that was was an aberration. That's not generally how you would do so. I don't think the issue was bad theory. I, th I think the issue was... Um, oh, may maybe the, the presence of, of... Just as the inappropriate application of theory. Like, you deploy theory to determine the site of the protest or, or the 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 timing or the reasons you, you don't you don't use it to determine the form generally because you know that that's at the level where you're deploying masses of people over which you have no real planning or control over like your 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 goal is just to get people into a space in in a direction with with a thing that can provoke some kind of response <sighs> theory theory would have been useful this was intuition yeah i don't know i i, I mean i th i think like that the quote by graber is is like it's not inherently wrong like it's an observation of something like potentially true um but it's being misapplied like it, it's it was it, it seems again just to stop the reading given here it seems like the issue wasn't that he was inherently wrong because it seems like it's sort of in the back of their minds the goal was really just kind of a swelling of popular uh, awareness of, of like the, the, the power of the the non you know the, the the people who are not embedded as as direct beneficiaries of, of capitalist exploitation or whatever um but it, it shouldn't be then directing how a protest as such is then organized or because like it couldn't decide what it was was it a protest was it was it like what what, what even was Occupy? It, it was it was strange like That's okay the problem yeah. yeah it wasn't really anything yeah it was I mean, kind of like we don't like this they occupied and the part like, of shit. wall street they occupied the part of wall street this is true but the part of wall street that none of the people with power in wall street actually occupy so it's like oh they're in the street great yeah is that, is that it <laughs> instead of banks. It was re-regulating the finance industry so that they can't rob the country. It was enforcing the actual existing laws so that these people wouldn't be incentivized to do this all over again. And it was running the economy in the interest of the population, not the lizard class. And if Graeber had listed those actual issues in that interview instead of saying, save the whales, then we would see right away how absurd his proposition was. If you're not in a position to do the types of things the state currently does, like if you're not in a position to start regulating finance and redistributing money from banks to humans, then the only way you're going to make the things that you want happen is by putting pressure on the people who do have that power to make those things happen and forcing them to obey you instead of their big moneyed circus trainers. And this is true whether you think the state is a legitimate institution or whether you think the state should ultimately be abolished. Like I said in an earlier episode, Graeber is kind of like the Ernie of politics from Ernie and Bert. Lots of great ideas, lots of charisma, a good heart, loved cookies, but a total chaotic mess who needs Bert to clean up after him. And that's the role that I'll be playing in this series. Oh my Something god. Something that seems to have been erased from the recent... He does have that, was <laughs> that was fucking scary. That was fucking scary. I, I, have, I, have to, I, I do have like some respect for him after that, though. That's celebratory retrospectives on Occupy is the fact that the pro-demands organizers sometimes <laughs> had huge majorities in the Occupy assemblies. So in order to keep their control over the movement, the anti-demands people pulled all kinds of anti-democratic shenanigans. First, they jacked up the required like majority to pass resolutions from 75% to 90%. And then they engaged in smear tactics against the pro-demands organizers, and they shut down their internet presence, and they even tried to physically disrupt their efforts. Ironically, the organizers were so wrapped up in their identities as anarchists that they ended up betraying the actual values of anarchism, democracy, and horizontalism. And instead, they acted like a, quote, what was I vanguard party, in the words of one of the pro-demands organizers. And you can read all about this stuff in an essay by sociologist and Occupy participant Susan Kang called Demands for the 99%, which I'll link to in the show notes. And so, no demands were made. 
And as a result, when the protests were eventually crushed, which anyone could have predicted, especially given that the movement was bound to lose energy without any accomplishments to keep it going, the movement had absolutely nothing to show for it at the end of the day. And the most damaging consequence of Occupy's No Demands whimpering belly flop is that it taught hundreds of millions and maybe billions of sympathizers around the world that organizing and mass mobilization are a waste of time. A juvenile exercise in blowing steam for college kids. You organize a zillion people, you get the world on your side, but who cares? Because nothing happens. Nothing changes. Like nothing ever changes. There's no point in even trying. While on one hand, interest in socialism had revived because of Occupy, which is one of Occupy's big successes, on the other hand, the anarchist and libertarian socialist varieties favored by the organizers lost an enormous amount of prestige and have faded in importance and relevance. To young people today who are facing increasingly grim futures and want results and real change, Lenin and increasingly Stalin are looked up to as models of people who know how to actually take power. What's up? What, did I say something? Oh, I think from sharing the screen, it, uh, it, it skipped a little bit and it had some of his dialogue go back, so I thought you were saying something. As people look for mighty superheroes oh, yeah. and vanguard ninja Of course I was saying something, because arrested. Stalin and Lenin were brought up. And so, the reason that I'm covering the dawn of everything is not just because David Graeber was a great anthropologist, but more importantly, because he was also an important activist who has many admirers and followers. And this book will have a tremendous influence on these people and on our movements and political imaginations going forward. This is one thing I don't like a little bit. Um, he's going to play up that he really respects and likes Graeber, and he's just going to shit on him for the entire review. Like at a deep, at a deeply uh, damning level where you can't really walk back from it. Damn. Much like Occupy Wall Street, the dawn of everything is a savant idiot mix of dazzling success and ridiculous <laughs> failure. It's a great success in that it puts some of the most important questions and issues of our age into public discourse maybe for the first time. How did we get stuck in these awful dominance hierarchies that are destroying our planet and our souls, and what can we do about it? And it directs us to look for those answers in anthropology, which is something that political theorists rarely think about or know about. And that's another testament to the poverty of our political culture, because you simply cannot understand politics without understanding anthropology. So this is a huge achievement. But much... That is not true, but whatever. It's like Occupy Wall Street and like the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. In fact, I would argue quite the contrary. Uh, you were at a serious disadvantage trying to understand anthropology if you did not understand politics. The book self-destructs because of some really foolish theoretical confusion and nonsense that renders the authors completely incapable of answering their own questions, even though the answers are staring them directly in their faces in the form of all of the amazing anthropological and archaeological and historical facts and anecdotes that comprise the book. And like Occupy or the 1381 Revolt, this gaping theoretical blind spot will set up readers for profound political failure and wasted opportunities if the incoherent message of this book is taken at face value. So, what is the message of this book, and why do I think that it's such a poison pill? The authors make all sorts of claims, but ultimately, everything they discuss in a 700 plus page book is geared towards one half-baked message. Human beings consciously choose our own social structures. Whether we live in a hierarchy with kings and patriarchy and serfs and slaves, or an egalitarian hunter-gatherer band with no authority figures and with gender equality, the form of our society and our social institutions is, and always has been, ultimately a matter of choice. And because it's a matter of choice, we can today choose a different path than the one we're on now, if we set our minds to it. The main obstacle is simply that something somewhere along the way went wrong, and we got confused, and we've forgotten that we have that choice. I say that this message is half-baked because what does it even mean to choose a social structure when different people have different ideas and conflicting interests? Do women in traditional patriarchal societies choose to be second-class humans and to subject themselves to abuse and rape and servitude? When people have different interests, why do some people get their way and other people don't? What is it that gives men the advantage that they need in order to impose the second class status on onto women in a patriarchy? Uh, that, that is uh, the kettle. Someone's making coffee. I'm sorry. Um, oh. I, I, have, uh, I have an immediate critique for this right now. Shoot. Thanks. Um, I have a similar critique. 
of uh, Graber and Wendro's book. But I don't like how he's framing it. Okay. Because so, he's, he's operating at a different yeah. level than they're operating at. So he's like, you have a patriarchal society. What does it mean for people in that community to choose? Like, do, do people in a patriarchal society, uh, do women in a patriarchal society who are abused and subjugated, do they, do they get to choose? Well, you're, you're already assigning a form then. Right? If you're assuming that that's kind of like at bedrock, where that's like the starting point. Well, then what, what is he referring to beyond that to account for that patriarchal society? He's going to start going into Jordan Peterson territory. Like it's, it's getting, it gets a little weird. Um, like he's, he's, he's talking about a rigidity of form when, uh, Graber and Wengro are talking quite specifically, not about forms of, uh, like familiar relations or things like that. They're, they're talking specifically about, well, like where it, it was, it was essentially mirroring James E. Scott. It's like, well, what, what made people decide to rely upon, uh, certain labor relationships or, or to depend upon like food sources that anchored them to a specific piece of territory. And, uh, there were, there were choices involved at some point, because at some point there were multiple options as to viable alternatives for organization and something caused them to pick one over the other. Now it doesn't mean they all got around in a circle and then took a vote, but like, I, I don't, I don't think there's inherently a problem with with that, um, my principal issue with that section is they equivocate again that between like different alternatives to politics. I, I don't, I don't think that is really what we're talking about. Like they talk about it as if there's like this parade of. I think it's actually their language, quite literally. There's there's a parade of different forms that they selected from, and it's like, well, no, you need to have like an awareness of these forms in advance to be choosing from among them, which means that they fell into them. Um, if they didn't have those, if they didn't exist yet, which is, they, they can't have because we're accounting for how they came to be. So, I mean, maybe if, if you cycled through a certain number over a period of time, you might, but like that already assumes different things. Like the fact, the, the idea that, uh, there's, there's some sort of canon of like organizational forms that they then were referred to as like, oh, it's a, the, the, the glacier has melted and the landscape has changed. Let's go back to the encyclopedia of how we organized in the past and let's pick which one we like the most today. It doesn't really work. Darkle Society. None of these questions or concepts ever arise in this book. The authors correctly point out that mode of subsistence categories like hunting and gathering and farming don't in and of themselves determine social structure. But then, why do we see the same patterns over and over again all over the world and across time? Why are the exceptions that the authors spend almost 100% of the book focusing on so exceptional? They have nothing to say about this. Everything you know is wrong, but there's nothing to replace it with. And nothing happens for any reasons besides magical choice, which doesn't really mean anything. Now, review after review of this book talks about how liberating it is to be free of the shackles of the conventional narratives about how social structure is a function of practical conditions that we find ourselves in. But there are two problems with this. For one thing, as we'll see shortly, Graeber and Wengro don't actually debunk the conventional narrative about social structure. They never even articulate it. And more importantly, believing nonsense that isn't true is not liberating. It's delusional and... Hey, Brooks, I'd love to have you on to to rant about this one at some point. Not tonight, but at some point. That'd, that'd be an interesting conversation. Potentially fatal. It's liberating in the same sense that smoking crack is liberating. It's a mindless rush that doesn't give you any tools except for false confidence. Like, smoking like if I tell crack you... is liberating. I like that. <laughs> From personal experience. Sorry, I I just... Yeah, like, she's... <laughs> I don't know why would I have that <laughs> Like, crack is... <laughs> liberating. Okay. Yeah, like, crack is liberating. I've, I've never heard it described that way. Stop limiting yourself to the conventional narrative about how we've been confined by gravity to be stuck on the ground. Sunday wasn't the book basically trying to debunk the biological origin of social structures. I don't know if it was trying to debunk the biological origin of social structures. I think it was trying to um, debunk the idea that there was some inevitable gravity around the state form. I think that's sort of where it was going at. I haven't gone through the whole thing. Everything. What's that? 
We're talking about Dawn of Everything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's... Well, yeah, basically. Sort of like gravity, but but specific gravities that have been sort of the trend within uh, anthropological and like political or whatever the hell thought. Um, yeah, such as like, you know, the whole like sort of, I guess you can say in a sense like good and evil or more more to say the human nature question. Like, don't don't get um, me wrong. Like, I, I've been I've been very generous with this book so far. Like, if I'm being very, very uh, cold about it, like it's bad. Like there, there are problems with it. There are a lot of like big problems with it. It's just there. It has, it has genuine merits that sort of offset that. Like it's, it's historical data is actually quite interesting. It's conceptually extremely fraught. Um, he's, he's not wrong. Like the, the message of it is, is not, is not fantastic. It feels some critiques that are salient of other like similar sort of like lower midbrow public sci books like he anything that is unpleasant at the expense of jared diamond or fukuyama is is or hell uh, P, uh stephen pinker is is gets extra points in my book um but like it it is it's it's not a, it's it's it doesn't represent a paradigm shift in the field i'll say that flying is a choice and I actually had a friend who literally tried to argue this with me once. Smokey D, I'm talking to you. Now, that might sound like a liberating message okay, if you're Smokey high. D. And my friend is called Smokey D because he smokes Pineapple Express amounts of weed. But if you take that idea seriously and you act on it, you will jump out the window and fall to your death. This is barely an exaggeration of what this book is telling us to do. After a roller coaster of 700 pages of fascinating facts and anecdotes from a dizzying array of fields, the authors have no answers for us as to their main thesis question of how we got stuck in these awful hierarchies for the past several thousand years. Besides the notion that it's all in our minds. Revolution is possible. How? Why? I don't know. Don't think about it. Just do it. The window's right there. It's all written with such charisma and optimism and breadth of scope that it's easy to miss how incoherent so much of it is unless you have some expertise in the subjects that they're talking about, in which case you see how so much of it is so incoherent that it's not even wrong, it's just nonsense. That's something else too, and, and again, to this guy's credit, like, um, he's speaking to uh, like a, a lay and largely activist, I would imagine, uh, audience that is going to be taking this as sort of like a, a primer, right? Like I'm, I'm approaching this as, as somebody who has some idea of where the categories they're deploying come from. If somebody is approaching this without that knowledge and they have no indication as to like the, the necessity of, of like some, some critical faculties along those lines, um, they're basically going to be educated out of the ability to be educated because What's, what's crucial here is I, I appreciate I appreciate the critiques of Fukuyama and uh, Steven Pinker and Jared Diamond because they're basically doing the exact same thing that Graeber and Wengro are doing, but to what I would deem to be like either either nefarious or or um, I mean you're basically watching uh, sloppy academics eat each other alive and it's sort of satisfying to see them do it because. Fukuyama and Pinker and, and Jared Diamond aren't aren't doing that to each other. They're kind of bolstering each other up, um, or or just and ignoring each other. Harari. What's up? And Yuval Noah Harari. And Yuval Noah Harari. Um. Oh God. I, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um. I love that part so much. <laughs> that was so awesome. <sighs> yeah. But at the same time. They're doing the same thing. They're just bashing down some other bad guys in the process. And so in my head, that mitigates some of the sloppiness here. But I wonder if that actually mitigates it for a general audience, if it's being taught uncritically, or if it's just being picked up from the store as being like, this is a reliable account, which it's not. Um, it's like James C. Scott. Like it has, it has genuine insights. Like it's valuable. It is legitimately valuable. Um, but you have to be able to pick out the valuable bits from like a whole lot of dross that will actually, if, if you like internalize it and that's like your bed, your baseline, 
Like, they, he doesn't just, they don't just critique um, Fukuyama and Jared Dimer and Pinker. They critique, for example, Hobbes and Rousseau through them. They treat them as effectively like modern emanations of those thinkers. They're very much not. They, they refer to them at various points. Um, Fukuyama, again, to his credit, refers to, like, positively to Rousseau, whereas Pinker, again, because idiots think Hobbes is, I should be nicer about that, but at that at that level, you are talking about idiots, frankly. Um, talk about Hobbes as if, because he has the the nasty, brutal, and short language, therefore he's, he's somehow, like, a more realistic and less airy-fairy thinker than Rousseau, despite the fact that Rousseau is perfectly willing to onboard, like, the total brutality of a state of nature, just he doesn't, he doesn't locate it as, like, or he doesn't characterize it as, um, you know, bourgeois subjects in the Hunger Games, which is effectively what Hobbes does. It's it's it, it's got it's got legitimate problems. It's got a lot of them, and uh, one of them is, as as I think about it in the light of this video, is it might inoculate people from actually taking a lot of these questions seriously, even if it's putting forward other questions that people might not pay attention to to begin with. So there there are issues. Yeah. Um, I think, I don't know, I, has, has, what is, like, from this point, from this video, has What Is Politics read the whole book? Uh, he seemed to be indicating, he, he made reference to, like, there's no point in this whole book where they explain this, or they, they give you, like... Oh my god, if that's actually the case, then I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm becoming a sad face right now, that's, that's very sad. Because I like, I mean, don't get me wrong, um... I also have a problem with the whole, you know, it's all in your imagination, all, it's all in your head type stuff. But I think there was aspects to it that I really liked and it was kind of warming up to me a bit when I was reading it because um, it seems to be like from this sort of, from their lens, uh, especially I think it was in chapter two, um, we liberty? can focus, we can focus, wait, what was that? That's Wicked Liberty, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, we can focus on basically rather than focusing on the I guess more stable aspects of a society, mm -hmm. we focus on where everything breaks down. And I, I want to I would like to see more examples of this, but the whole idea that society sort of like, you know, break down everything or like flip their own society on its head um, at some point or at some level, like uh, for example. Um, what is it? Um, oh, can you, uh, what's up with your, I think your mic is, um, I think it's like a fan in the background or something. Uh, nope. I think it might be on your end. Oh, do you think so? Okay. Um, well, now it's gone, so I don't, so maybe not. Uh, but, um, what's the saying? Oh, basically, these points, it focuses more on, like, uh, when societies think about its own society, I guess, and how, and this gets into, like, the whole part about travel logs or about, um, uh, what is it, holidays, like uh, Saturnalia, or even today with, like, in America, or in a lot of other places as well, but I'm focusing on America here, we have the holidays, like, basically Thanksgiving and uh, up to New Year's, we completely change our narrative um, from being this like very individualist, capitalist, go-getter narrative into this sort of, you know, charity, family, it's all about, like, loving thy neighbor type stuff. Um, and I think that's a very interesting perspective and could especially be very useful to... Um, a subsection of the society that is looking for that society to change. Um, but if it is just kind of like it's all in our head type stuff, it's going to continue this trend of uh, socialism that I actually find extremely irritating. Um, that's neither here nor there. So we'll just continue. It reminds me of the movie Billy Madison, featuring Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts alumnus Adam Sandler. Billy Madison is a 28-year-old man who needs to redo elementary school and high school over the course of a few months in order to prove to his dad that he deserves his inheritance. And in one scene that reminds me of The Dawn of Everything, 
Billy has to do a Jeopardy style quiz show contest to test everything that he's learned. And then when he gets a difficult question about literature and the Industrial Revolution, it seems like all hope is lost. But then he brilliantly synthesizes everything he learned during the course of the film, from his kindergarten class, where he read The Little Puppy That Could, through grade 12 biology, all into a wonderful, funny, inspiring, triumphant narrative. And then the whole audience jumps up and gives him a roaring standing ovation. And when the applause dies down, the principal gives his evaluation. What you've said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. Now, what I want to do with this book review is turn nonsense... So he wants to get he wants to get that sweet, sweet ad revenue for 6,000 views so he didn't put the actual clip. That's what he wants to do. ...into sense by filling in the gaps of this book with all of the things that Graeber and Wengro neglected to mention that we need to know about if we want to understand how social structure works and how it can be changed. Instead of telling you, yes, we can fly, it's our choice to defy gravity. Here's a sweet window. Go for it. I'm going to say, yes, we can fly, but first, we need to build airplanes. So where Graeber and Wengro are telling us that we can just change our social structure, but they don't have the slightest clue how, what I'm going to do is tell you, yes, we can change our social structure, but here are the principles and ingredients of hierarchy or equality. Here are the constraints and the limits that incentivize one or the other. Here is why some societies have male dominance and others don't. Here's why some societies have authority figures and others don't. Here is why some societies shift back and forth from more hierarchy to more equality in different seasons. And here's what we can learn from all this to apply to our current situation. See, this is, again, like there are little bits here that's getting me like a little bit sussy on the uh, the Jordan Peterson angle. Um, why why do we need to know... Sussy. Sussy, sussy wussy. Why, why, do we, why do we need to integrate... Um, particular reasons for why this culture here was male dominated and this one over here wasn't uh, in order to generate um, viable proposals for how to restructure society now like that doesn't that's weird that you would include that you know yeah yeah, yeah I get what you're saying so let's get into the actual text of chapter one. The authors begin by telling us that most people don't think about the broad sweep of human history very much. But when we do, quote, It's usually when reflecting on why the world seems to be in such a mess, and why human beings so often treat each other badly. The reasons for war, greed, exploitation, systematic indifference to others' suffering. Were we always like that, or did something at some point go terribly wrong? Unquote. And according to the authors... I like how he paused it to put an image on the screen, but it had no text. There's just a picture of the book we already know he's reviewing. There are two standard answers to this, which have been with us since the Enlightenment, if not since biblical times. One of these answers, famously articulated by Thomas Hobbes, basically says that people are inherently selfish and operate mostly based on self-interest. And this is why we need authority figures and police and coercion to keep us from killing and destroying each other. And the other answer... Hobbes never said that. ...articulated by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, tells us that people are innately altruistic and cooperative, but it's the coercive institutions of civilization, oh. like authority and private property, that corrupt us and pit us against each other. No. No. Oh, God. He hasn't, he hasn't read anything before Weber, if he's even read Weber. I have, I have a suspicion, because I've, I've seen poli textbooks... Like the kind that you that's get. What from... I was, that's exactly what I was gonna say. Well, like, because, like, like I don't know, like, uh, like Pearson and whatnot, like those big glossy ones look like giant magazines, where it's like Introduction to Political Theory or something, and it'll it'll give. What is a liberal? It's it... someone who votes Democrat. Well, it'll it'll basically give you like a definition of the definition of politics that Weber gives, just completely out of context with no reference. It'll just say, "What is politics?" Well, it is. And they'll give you this. They won't tell you where this came from or why or what he was responding to um and they'll they'll, they'll just run off of that and you can you can sort of be systematic that way like it's not like you you inherently lose all rigor at that point but like the floor of your theory is like it's standing on a bunch of stilts that you've never even considered like he this this guy there's no way in hell that he's seriously read Hobbes or Rousseau like I'm I'm certain that at some point he's encountered them and has sort of glossed over them but when you already know what they say in advance cuz 
you're running again off of like textbook caricatures, then you're just not going to pay attention to what they're actually doing. Turning us into selfish brutes. These stories have been with us since the Enlightenment, and they have roots in biblical times, the idea of original sin, or the what? fall from Eden, but they have modern equivalents. So you have people like Steven Pinker, who is the quintessential modern Hobbesian, according to the authors, who argues in his book The Better Angels of Our Nature that human history and prehistory was just one big giant murder-starvation festival until the structures and institutions of modern, liberal, representative, democratic market civilization finally allowed us to have order and prosperity. And then you have the modern versions of Rousseau, and they cite Jared Diamond and Francis Fukuyama as examples who in their recent books both state that human beings started out as egalitarian hunter-gatherers and then ended up in different forms of hierarchy after the advent of farming and private property. And surprisingly, the authors argue that both these modern Hobbes and Rousseau versions are extremely depressing and pessimistic. The Hobbes version is pessimistic for obvious reasons, because it assumes that we're selfish to the core. But the authors also see the Rousseau version as being pessimistic, even though it says that humans have an egalitarian, altruistic nature, best suited to freedom, direct democracy, and cooperation. Because according to the authors, this idea is mostly deployed to tell us that equality and freedom are nice and all, but that is only possible for people who live in tiny hunter-gatherer bands, such that, quote, while the system we live under might be unjust, the most we can realistically aim for is a modest bit of tinkering. And they go on to tell us that the term inequality is kind of like a conspiracy to erase class power and to make us focus on abstractions, which is basically the opposite of the truth, which I talk about at length in my critique of the conclusion of chapter two of Dawn of Everything. Well. Thankfully, they tell us both these stories are wrong. And instead, they're going to tell us a hopeful story that gives us back our agency and that makes the type of society that we live in ultimately a matter of choice. Now, there are a few things that we need to understand here. In that, that, this, this critique is fair, by the way. Like, their, their approach to Rousseau and, and Hobbes is a butchery. First of all, the thing that they're saying distinguishes them. Their, their accounts are identical there. Um, <laughs> Rousseau is quite explicit. You can't go back. Like, the, the, the bare fact that um, we were conditioned to require uh, modern social institutions to live... Uh, by history doesn't mean that therefore we can just like wind back the clock and undo that nor does it mean you would want to in fact he's very explicit that he would not want to um the 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 point is just that uh the reasons why a modern subject would enter into a civil society are not identical to what um an individual in the state of nature would enter into a civil society um one is going to be conditioned by uh, basically, like, practice and new technologies which generate new needs and new, like, baselines of what is tolerable, what is intolerable. Um, and the other one is just, they already have, like, all of their faculties and preferences to begin with, and they just choose, they make the obvious decision, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, geared towards this kind of living, therefore I will, of course, make the obvious deal, I'll give up my rights to all of your stuff if you respond in kind. And then we'll like enter the social contract, and we'll we'll set up a, a power to keep us all to our to our ends of the deal, and it'll be great. Like that's, but but the in terms of everything else, like they're they're functionally identical. Um, it's it's the like they're 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 no less optimistic about our capacity to just exit a modern state form. The point though is that one is conditioned by history, one isn't. Um. Which, like, it, it, it bears on a lot of other stuff that Rousseau does. Like, his notion of sovereignty is different. But, like, in, in terms of, like, the, the nature of human beings, like, the idea that Rousseau is somehow nicer is just categorically false. In order to Rousseau put was a sweet person. Into... Rousseau was a... Rousseau was the worst. No, Rousseau was a good person. Rousseau was, Rousseau was not a good person. Marx was a tremendously... Sweet. Marx was Marx was a good person. Rousseau was... So is a terrible person. Context. First, as regards human nature, no one with any expertise in the relevant subjects believes in either the Rousseau or Hobbes good versus evil versions of human nature anymore. These debates were happening until into the 90s. But by now, the general picture that comes from decades of psychology experiments and anthropology and archaeology is that, surprise, surprise, people are both innately selfish and altruistic. 
though there are still some very interesting debates on the nature of altruism, which is a debate for another episode. Yeah, Rousseau doesn't say uh, human beings are altruistic. The, the reason why human beings are peaceful in a state of nature is because we have no property uh, to fight for or to uh, try to acquire by force from other people. And we don't have the force or the, the habit of forming aggregate forces in order to make success sure enough that we would habituate ourselves to doing so. Um, so that's like, we're, we're just not interested in each other. That's, that's why we're, we're peaceful in, in the, like the lowest state of nature for, or the earliest rather state of nature for Rousseau. Uh, it's nothing to do with us, us being altruistic, actually quite the opposite. We're, whereas we're completely disinterested in each other in both ways. Like we, we do still have like a, a, a basic level of, like we, we can still feel empathy. Like he, he takes pains to point out like, uh, we, we respond to other members of our species crying and things like that. Um, but that's not, that's not unique to people in the state of nature. That doesn't account for why we're peaceful in the state of nature, as opposed to, uh, tending to war and exploitation, um, in a state of civil society. Like it's, it just doesn't bear on the question. Now, when it comes to theories about the origins of inequality and hierarchy, the picture is different. The Steven Pinker Hobbesian idea of prehistory consisting of constantly warring tribes being so innately selfish that we've always needed alpha male authority figures to dominate us since the beginning of time, that's an idea that a majority of ordinary people living in our capitalist realist hellscape might believe. But almost zero people with any expertise in anthropology or archaeology believe or have believed this since the 1970s. The fact that an author with so much prestige and access to resources as Steven Pinker can be repeating debunked ideas from the 1950s should be extremely embarrassing to him and to his publishers. Hang on, I just need to save this quickly. I, I enjoy this picture very much. Thank you for this. Thank you. Okay, keep going. Meanwhile, the Rousseauianish idea about humans originating as egalitarian hunter-gatherers for 95% of our existence, and then shifting towards more and more hierarchy after the advent of agriculture, has been, and still is, the majority, almost consensus view among anthropologists, and has been since the late 1960s, after the Man the Hunter conference that I talked about when I covered the conclusion of Chapter 2 of the book. Graeber and Wengro tell us that... When it comes to cherry-picking anthropological case studies and putting them forward as representatives of our contemporary ancestors, that is, as models for what humans might have been like in a state of nature, those working in the tradition of Rousseau tend to prefer African foragers like the Hadza, the Pygmies, or the Kung. Those who follow Hobbes prefer the Yanomami." Unquote. But what they don't tell us is that most anthropologists think that most of us probably resembled something like the egalitarian Hadza, or Pygmies, or Kung, while none of them think that we were like the male-dominated, endlessly feuding Yanomami. Why is that? We'll see in a few minutes. Now, the next thing to understand when you're reading this book is that the... I have no point of reference for this. What I do know um, with some confidence is that uh, Hobbes and Rousseau do not have a strong direct influence on anthropology today, generally. I think that's that's mistaken. I could be yeah. wrong in that. I'm not in anthropology, but I, what I've seen, what I've read, I do not see that is a salient debate the narrative yeah, I'm that graber and we're sure is the, that is the case i think you're right when gross spend the early chapters in the book pretending to debunk isn't actually a narrative that anyone with any expertise really believes it's a deliberate convenient tip asks is there language in russo's state of nature uh in a way there uh, russo actually has an essay on the origin of languages which you should check out because it's actually pretty interesting an oversimplification of a much more complicated picture that has all sorts of interesting if entirely and reversals and timelines that are just too complicated to explain in a short article or even in a book that isn't specifically about the Paleolithic or about the origins of inequality. And the people that they keep referring to, Francis Fukuyama, Noah Harari, Steven Pinker, or even Jared Diamond, these people aren't experts in the relevant subjects to human origins. They're popular writers with expertise in other fields who use the elevator pitch version of the conventional narrative of human origins in order to make points about other things. It's like if I wrote a book about how the conventional narrative about the four seasons is wrong, and I say things like, experts like Big Bird and Elmo and Dora the Explorer will have us believe that there are only four seasons. No. First, the story goes, Yo. you have summer. Yo! <laughs> Oh my god.
What's with this children's show theme we've got going here? I don't. Okay, honestly, I don't like that. I, I see. I feel like this is a little bit too common. Um, whatever. Uh, actually, on this point, um, actually, let's just continue it because I want to see. I, I want to see where this ends up. Which is warm and sunny, and then you have fall, which is cold and rainy, and then you have winter, which is even more cold and snowy. And then comes spring, where it warms up and rains, so that March showers bring May flowers, and the cycle starts anew. But is it realistic to assume that the same four seasons happen like this every year, for millions of years? Well, the evidence shows the opposite. Summer is supposed to be sunny, but last year it rained 20 times. And winter? Yeah, right. In Arizona, there's never even any snow at all. And it's sunny all year round in the Arabian Desert. Yet Muppets still cling to this fantasy of snowy winters with Rudolph and Prancer and Santa. Oh, and in India, they only have two seasons. And in Australia, it's summer in December. Maybe it's about time we do away with this whole mythology about seasons entirely. Weather is a choice. Are you guys having fun yet? Because I'm having fun. In Graeber and Wangro's own words, quote, we should be clear here. Social theory hey, always... No, 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 hold on, hold on. Okay, I do. Okay, I have some issues. Okay, first I, I of all, too. um, well, yeah, basically the, 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 the big bird in the room is, um, are these particular examples that David Wengro and David Graeber bring up, are they, uh, basically just, they themselves just, um, evidence uh, like is that like the only evidence more or less for i guess uh the option here or the or the importance of like an imagination around like what is possible for our society or for our cultures um no because it's not just the fact that they are different but more the fact that they um seem to have a process of change within them that they're like they're literally changing their societies like they're changing clothes right um yeah. i think that's pretty important well and, actually actually yeah. on that point um the the analogy would be like what what is the appropriate as you say what is the appropriate clothing for this particular season right um not Like, the season analogy itself seems to get the causality wrong. Like, the entire point is that the, the constantly changing situation requires constantly changing forms. And so they would, they would have this plethora of forms in their repertoire over time. Um, yeah, but at the same time, they're also saying that it's not necessarily, or at least it's not environmental or something like that. It seems to be that it's maybe society reacting to itself, which is why it changes. Um, I if I, I can't like remember the particular parts. Gosh, I wish I had like the, the book right here in front of me. Um, but I think it was also in chapter two. Was uh, if you just look up Inuit, because I know that was brought up. Um, right. you would have like Inuit uh, peoples who would do this change of like, what is it? I think it was. They described it as like authoritarian and like less authoritarian or something like that. It was like in the summer they would be more authoritarian and like in or I think it was in the winter they're more authoritarian. In the summer they're less authoritarian, something like that. Um, and this like practice. Uh, is that sort of switching seasonally, like your your structure, happens with other cultures, um, I guess other Inuit cultures, right, yeah, maybe yeah. like Yupik like culture or something like that. It's, um, it's a, a but it's they a do it three. in a yeah they do it in a different they do it in a different way. Um, they do it like the exact opposite, but yet they're in the same climate, and oftentimes there's like similar climates have same yeah. have similar like. Here, yeah. I'll, I'll read the actual relevant section because it's just a paragraph. Uh, the authors begin uh, referring to uh, a text by Marcel Mauss and Henry, I think it's Beauchat. Yeah, um, there we go. 
uh, seasonal variations of the Eskimo, the authors begin by observing that the circumpolar Inuit, and likewise many other societies, have two social structures, one in summer and one in winter, and that in parallel they have two systems of law and religion. In the summer, Inuit disperse into bands of roughly 20 or 30 people to pursue uh, freshwater fish, caribou, and reindeer, all under the authority of a single male elder. During this period, property was possessively marked and patriarchs exercised coercive, sometimes even tyrannical power over their kin, much more so than the Nambiquara chiefs in the dry season. But in the long winter months, when seals and walrus flocked to the Arctic shore, there was a dramatic reversal. Then Inuit gathered together to build great meeting houses of wood, whale rib, and stone. Within these houses, virtues of equality, altruism, and collective life prevailed. Wealth was shared, and husbands and wives exchanged partners under the Aegis of Sedna, the goddess of the sea. Intriguing. Um, anyways, so... Like, it, it seems to be kind of the opposite point that he's making in criticism of them. Um, like, it, it's it's not... Like... like the the point isn't that like there there is no impinging force of necessity. The point is that it's not static and stable and admits of no choice whatsoever. Like that's 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 yeah. the point. Yeah. And they yeah, do... sorry, my, my uh, computer just fucking died because I was being an idiot, a massive idiot. But it's fine. I'm on my phone now, so I'm all good. Okay. Well, you're um, still be on. Yeah, I'm on other thing. Necessarily. Uh, involves a bit of... Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, were you going to say something? Actually, I forgot what... The, sorry, that just, like, completely put me out of whack. Uh, we were talking about it being a choice. Yeah, basically, I don't think it's that simple. It's just, like... I guess, I, yeah, this is where I am giving a lot more, like, credit. Um, especially to Graeber and Wingrow's conceptualization of of this idea that, like, we have... Uh, this choice, um, I think maybe it's not like in a complete like free will sort of way, but it's obviously not as mechanical as we tend to think of it. Um, which is, I think, more what they're, you know, they're getting at. Yeah. Uh, and that there's it seems to be like something, something that these societies like have that we have, but just not to the same intensity. Like, obviously, it's a far, um, this sort of, like, seasonal, like, social structure, you know, flip um, is a far cry from what do we have? Like, okay, during the holidays, you're just, you know, you're just a little bit more charitable. That's kind of it. Simplification. Social theory is largely a game of make-believe in which we pretend, just for the sake of argument, that there's just one thing going on. Essentially, we reduce everything to a cartoon so as to be able to detect patterns that would be otherwise invisible. As a result, all real progress in social science has been rooted in the courage to say things that are, in the final analysis, slightly ridiculous. The works of Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, or Claude Lévi-Strauss being only particularly salient cases in point. One must simplify the world in order to discover something new about it. The problem comes when, long after the discovery has been made, people continue to simplify." Unquote. But like any other experts, anthropologists only simplify when writing for popular audiences, just like any scientist or astronomer or doctor or mechanic. So Graeber and Wengro go around pretending that they're debunking the cartoon version of the standard narrative, but they never actually tell you what the full version of the narrative is, or why most anthropologists think that the cartoon version is still a pretty good elevator pitch despite all of the supposedly contradictory facts that comprise the dawn of everything. And in a few minutes, I'll explain to you what the consensus narrative actually is so that you can evaluate it for yourself against the supposed debunking of it. To be fair to Graeber and Wengro, while there are tons of articles discussing all of the exceptions to the summary narrative that they focus on, there aren't many expert writers integrating all of these facts into a nice grand narrative for public consumption. So writing a new revised grand narrative is fair game. And there is room given the facts to postulate that there was more hierarchy in the past than we currently think there was. But not for the reasons that Graeber and Wengro give us, because they don't actually give us any reasons. Their whole book is based on throwing out even the idea of having reasons for things. That's not true. That's not true at all. Um, the, the, again, the narrative of the Inuit that we just visited here uh, directly belies that. 
the, the reasons are, are concretely given. There are moments of scarcity where you require like strict organization in order for the community as such to survive at the scale it, it sustains itself more easily when it's out of those moments of scarcity. It's that's wrong. That's actually just a flat out misrepresentation of the book. I'm not even a fan of the book, honestly. Like it's got problems, but like that that's just that's actually not fair. Everything is just magical choice and theater. Their oh, words, not mine, which we'll see when we cover chapter three or four. Compare the dawn of everything to a recent article by anthropologist Man. Yeah, but even in theater, you have a, even in theater, you have a, you know, you have a script. Yeah. You have a, you have like a stage, right? You have lights. You got, you got plenty of like aspects that determine how you act within it. Um, you know, yeah. Well, let's uh, continue. Wacky published in 2021. This article tries to argue many of the same things that Graeber and Wengro argue in their book, mostly that there was a lot more diversity of social organization in the Paleolithic. Yeah, Brooke makes a good point. They are critiquing that we simplify, referring to anthropologists, but we only simplify when writing for a popular audience. Like like the book I'm critiquing, which is written for a popular audience, which is simplified. <laughs> it's like, like this, this, this book is not directed at like high level political scientists or anthropologists. That's why they're specifically targeting people like Fukuyama and Pinker and Jared Diamond, because they're also writing for popular audiences. Like it's This is this is what's rubbing me the wrong way about this. Like he's trying to play like, hey, I'm one of you. I just have concerns about the efficacy of this book for the revolution or whatever. Um, but then his his approach is just like dripping with actual like contempt and he inserts things that are kind of like they're weird. Like in all of this, he's he's complained that uh Wengro and Graber seem to sort of imply that it's just we can just we can just pick. We can just pick at random, we just just whimsy. We could we can choose how we organize ourselves socially through sheer whim. Just wouldn't that be lovely? Let's do it. That's all. Um, but at the same time, he's also filtering in things like we need to follow anthropology so we know specifically why some societies are, are male dominated and some aren't. It's I maybe there's some like very high level theorizing going on. This is beyond my comprehension, but it seems to me that the the only reason why at this level of discourse you'd be bringing that up, um is to indicate that, well, maybe there are situations in a modern society in which we actually do need male dominance. Or we'll fall into chaos. Like, it's it's getting it's getting weird at parts. And he genuinely, he genuinely seems to really, really dislike the authors. Like, he's made some... For God's sake, he, he broke into it saying this is like an idiot savant piece. Like, it's... That's not... That is not yeah, I love a conciliatory <laughs> description. Right? Like, yeah, I'm sorry, but what is politics if you're watching this? Like, maybe, like, maybe you're just really getting into it, which I understand. I mean, I, I do the same thing. You can probably tell. Um, but you can't be like, oh, I love these people. Like, they're great. And then be like, you know, it's like smoking crack. And that's liberation and then like like look oh big bird and gravity we can fly like that's that's, that's kind of hard hitting you know look what I'm guys saying? look guys i have i have an abiding respect for david for the late david graber who was an ex he says this in like one of the other uh review episodes of this he was he was an excellent anthropologist he made such wonderful contributions to the field let me tell you how he just fucking misrepresents it to a bunch of uh, lay people and just d destroys their capacity to understand the world and he's just gonna he's gonna botch our, our ability to organize politically forever. Like, okay. But I but I like him. He's David Graeber is a good one. Like what what is that? It's it's weird. It's weird. Graeber more like doesn't understand anthropology or politics. It's kind of like um smoke crack. It's sort of like someone, like like a, a religious apologist, quote unquote, who's sort of like, "Hey guys, like, 
Um, so here, here's here's the thing. Like, of course, I, like you, have an abiding respect for the words of the Apostle Paul. Da, da, da. But he kind of fucked us over, didn't he? He ruined, he ruined everything for thousands of years, and we're doomed because of him. It's like... Yeah, he thought fucking smoking crack was liberation. Like, I... Call me presumptuous, but I think he's lying. <laughs> I don't think he likes him at all. Yeah, I don't think smoking crack makes liberation either. Then the largely egalitarian portrait painted by the standard narrative. But in order to get to that hypothesis, Singh and Glowacki use the basic analytical tools that the standard narrative is based on, i.e. they work from the same assumptions about how the environment shapes social structure that everyone else works from. Now, I still disagree with Singh and Glowacki's interpretation of the facts, but reading it will not make you stupid the way that the dawn of everything will. <laughs> because Singh and Glowacki have a basic understanding of how social organization works, and Graeber and Wengro want to obscure that understanding in order to make everything look like it's some kind of random choice. Lest we forget, though, this guy thinks that uh, politics is basically encompassed just by any decision-making in groups. Whatever that means. Like... <laughs> For which he gives no citations. The third thing to think about when reading this book is that when they tell us that, quote, Nowadays, the standard narrative is mostly deployed to convince us that while the system we live under might be unjust, the most we can realistically aim for is a bit of modest tinkering, unquote. Love the player, hate the game. See, the problem, Waxwing, is that, like, I, 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 could, I could be on board with this if he was... I actually like Liquid Zulu's uh, video on the three-body problem more than I like this. Um... That I, I hated that, by the way, like a lot. I mean, I, I, I liked it more than this. But... Wait, Liquid Zulu talked about the three body problem? Wow. Oh, and it was a butchery. I was on, I talked, uh, I was talking with Brooks about that one. It was on stream a little while ago. In, uh, the, these, well, I, haven't, these... I haven't read three body problem yet. I need to do that and yeah. just to watch the video. Well, you're missing out. Um, but like, th this guy's not like, like, look, we're, we're playing, we're playing like chess here. And he's he's jumping in like, hey, I know how this is actually played, idiots. And now he's playing Connect Four with the pawns. So... <laughs> that this is incredibly misleading. They quote Jared Diamond to the effect that you can't have a stateless society or direct democracy once you go above 10,000 people. Quote, as Diamond patiently explains to us. Large populations can't function without leaders who make the decisions, executives who carry out the decisions, and bureaucrats who administer the decisions and laws. Allow okay, you want to bet that he's going to defend Jared Diamond's take here? How? Oh. If he does, if he does, then he's done. I'm just curious. Do you think you don't think he's going to? No, I don't think so. All right, let's see. Alas, for all you readers who are anarchists and dream of living without any state government, those are the reasons why your dream is unrealistic. You'll have to find some tiny band or tribe willing to accept you, where no one is a stranger, and where kings, presidents, and bureaucrats are unnecessary. Unquote. But the authors don't mention all the expert anthropologists who think the exact opposite, that our egalitarian origins prove that we can and should organize in ways that maximize freedom and equality. Yeah, and they don't mention that the people who argue this the most ardently tend to be the people who specialize in egalitarian hunter-gatherer bands and who know them the best. Whether you think it's correct or not, the story of humans as egalitarian hunter-gatherers who eventually got derailed into hierarchy and oppression by the advent of agriculture has been the narrative favored by basically every revolutionary-minded person with any interest in anthropology since Hang on, I want to I want to relist the last couple of seconds because there was something wrong there. Tend to be the people who specialize in egalitarian hunter-gatherer bands and who know them the best. Whether you think it's correct or not, the story of humans as egalitarian hunter-gatherers who eventually got derailed into hierarchy and oppression by the advent of agriculture has been the narrative favored by basically every revolutionary-minded person with any interest in anthropology since Rousseau himself. From the anthropologist Lewis Henry Morgan in the 19th century, who influenced Marx and Engels, to hunter-gatherer experts like Leslie White, Eleanor Leacock, and Richard Lee, who were extensively in the 1970s to the 1990s, and Lee still writes today, down to the hunter-gatherer experts in the radical anthropology group, who are very active today, like Jerome Lewis, Camilla Power, Chris Knight, and Morna Finnegan. 
These are all people who thought and think that the proper form for industrial civilization is an adaptation of the same egalitarianism which we were born into as a species. It's what Marx called the riddle of history. The idea that humans evolved in and are thus best suited to a life of freedom and equality. And all of human history, since we lost our freedom of equality, has been a mess of people trying to regain their freedom at the expense of other people. There's, there's, a, there's a confusing discord here between... I can't use that word anymore because it means something else. There's a confusing, there's a confusing uh, dissonance between um, the notion of egalitarian and, and of autonomy that's being deployed to describe quote-unquote egalitarian hunter bands and the kind of egalitarian... like the, the notion of egalitarianism or, or autonomy that you would deploy in the, the context of a political community. Um, one is literally talking about a... a a, a geometrically brown gra uh uh what's the word um partition space in which you as as an agent have the right to exercise uh full discretion as to what you do it's like the whole notion of like within uh your uh your 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 domus you can um or within your oikos you can uh, dispose of your servants and your children and your spouse as you will if you're the patriarch, right? Like that that would be, or or like uh, conduct whatever religious rites or whatever you, you want within within your the space of your household. That would be what's understood by autonomy. Um, it, or it'd be a, like a law unto oneself. Egalitarianism, I, I mean, there there's isonomy. There's the idea that there's only one law for uh, every citizen, regardless of, of, of class or, or wealth ranking or whatever, um, you wouldn't have that in the context of a non-landed hunter-gatherer community that doesn't have those strict partitions, because that's a political principle in particular. So when they're talking about like egalitarianism, I, I don't know if they actually mean egalitarianism or if they simply mean like the heights to which the power of one uh, party can aspire is simply not great enough that it represents some like overwhelming force that can dominate the rest you know like if, if we're talking about uh positive alternatives that can actually translate into a large-scale society then it gets it gets a lot confusing um and i think just kind of assuming that there's like sort of one-to-one -one parity between these terms is 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 very good god it's, it's, there's issues. Well, words are whatever you make of them, so. It's profound. Go yeah, take that to what you will. Which is a hopeless and self-defeating endeavor, which can never bring peace or happiness. And that therefore, the only solution is to go back to a life of freedom and equality, which the fruits of advanced civilization finally make possible for us to achieve once again. This version of the standard narrative is glaringly absent from the pages of Dawn of Everything. Now, as regards the fatalistic views of people like Jared Diamond and Harari and Fukuyama, like I talk about in my ongoing Class vs. Culture series, every idea that's a threat to power, whether it's socialism, anarchism, feminism, anti-racism, Christianity, you name it, these types of ideas will always end up being filtered through elite institutions and elite people into watered-down, defanged versions of themselves that support the existing power structure, or at least that don't threaten it. For example, the Care Bears version of Martin Luther King that we get on TV in high school history classes versus the real-life socialist one. By only pointing to people who use the standard narrative to resign us to hierarchy, while ignoring the history of that narrative as a force for equality, Graeber and Wengro are misleading us, while weakening their own arguments. So back to the standard narrative. What is it? And do Graeber and Wengro disprove it? Do they even really disagree with it at the end of the day? I think we'll, we'll, we'll finish off at this section, we'll pick it up another day. Because there's, there's a whole... There's a whole yeah, there's a lot. Of the, Holy yeah, yeah. fuck! We're we have our work cut out for us at least, but we'll, we'll pick this up soon. By the way, are you going to be on the Sunday symposium on Sunday? This Sunday? Yeah, I'm going to try and hold. Uh, on what's what is this exactly? I'm sorry, I was not informed. You did not inform me of this. I did. Oh, oh, that's unfortunate. Um, 
basically I took got the idea from Digital Gnosis where he has um, periodic uh, hangout streams where there's a streamer link in the chat so people can just come in and talk about different things if they if they want to and we'll have like some topics set up. I, I know that uh, Urzat's Realism wanted to talk to me about moral realism for some reason. So, or well, not Urzat's Realism, Urzat's Philosophy or something. Um, I think. It was Urzat something. Anyway, somebody wanted to talk to me about moral realism, so I put that as one of the possible topics that could be discussed. And anybody who's in the chat can come in up to six people. Um, if it gets, if it picks up and there ends up being like a backlog of people who want to come in, or I guess like a bunch of people in the studio, then I might actually be willing to um, start paying for the uh, client version that gives us like space for up to like 12. But, you know, it's just a, just a group chat kind of thing. Um, I may not be able to this Sunday due to work, um, particularly because I have to wake up early and, you know, that is, um, that is fair. but I'll see you for next Sunday. Yeah. I'm going to, if it goes well, I'm going to try and do them regularly. Okay, cool. According to the authors, quote, to give just a sense of how different the emerging picture is from the standard narrative, it's now clear that human societies before the advent of farming were not confined to small, egalitarian bands. On the contrary, the world of hunter-gatherers as it existed before the coming of agriculture was one of bold social experiments, resembling a carnival parade of political forms, far more than it does the drab abstractions of evolutionary theory. Agriculture did not mean the inception of private property, nor did it mark an irreversible step towards inequality. In fact, many of the first farming communities were relatively free of ranks and hierarchies. And far from setting class differences in stone, a surprising number of the world's earliest cities were organized on robustly egalitarian lines, with no need for authoritarian rulers, ambitious warrior politicians, or even bossy administrators. Okay, now with the caveat that again, I think James C. Scott and Wenger and Graeber play fast and loose with their terms when they're talking about cities and, and all these different terms, all these different categories. Um, James C. Scott actually made a very strong case, which Wenger and Graeber rely upon, basically, uh, for how in fact you, you did have, um, you did have agriculture uh, in and even hunter gatherer societies, and you did have, you could have uh, these things while not having like a strict hierarchical uh, modern state form or even even like an ancient state form if you want to be loose with that term and also pastoralists i don't know why we keep leaving them out but you know Cause, whatever because because screw the pastoralists they're cheating they don't they don't count i don't know i don't know i don't know bunny tooth this guys this guy's wearing a star trek uniform i don't know yeah why is he wearing a star trek uniform i don't know oh, he doesn't weird. wear it in any of his his other videos i guess he just it's just so random. I just, uh, okay, let's continue. Unquote. Now, nothing they're telling us here is new or controversial, besides the stuff about egalitarian cities. When you read anthropology articles about social organization in the Paleolithic, or the transition to agriculture, scholars routinely discuss all of this stuff, that there were sedentary and semi-sedentary hunter-gatherers in the Paleolithic, particularly in Europe in the Upper Paleolithic, and that the shift to hierarchy after agriculture didn't happen overnight. There were relatively egalitarian farming settlements at first that often lasted hundreds or even thousands of years. The progression from equality to hierarchy was slow and patchy, and although everyone agrees that agriculture led to increased hierarchy, different authors propose different theories and reasons for the extended timeline of that progression, none of which are articulated in this book despite lots and lots of pages and despite the relevance of those theories to the author's thesis. Later on in the book, Graeber and Wangaro actually admit that, okay, yeah, after agriculture became dominant, societies eventually did become more and more hierarchical, but they treat it like it must be a coincidence or something. It didn't happen overnight, so obviously agriculture doesn't lead to hierarchy. What is the relationship between... No, it means it doesn't necessitate hierarchy. That's the point. I, I, I don't... I don't. I, I would want to see, like, a quote here to justify that statement. Agriculture and hierarchy. Or between population density and hierarchy. Or between mode of subsistence and social structure. They barely even look into it, never mind coming up with an answer. The story is different when it comes to the idea of egalitarian cities, which genuinely does seem to go against the standard narrative in archaeology. And if it's true that there were neither of these things are cities, they're large scale dwellings. But again, like he's, he's just, that's, that's the problem with like 
just taking textbook definitions and just deploying them you can't you can't like situate yourself as like an authority on anthropology and then just be deploying textbook like wikipedia tier definitions of of these things backwards to like make descriptive judgments um about about how these different forms of community uh subsisted or or, or organized like this is not we're not looking at a city here like i'm sorry that that's a term that has like particular content um we're looking at a large-scale dwelling with stone structures but like crucially like Wait, what even, do we, even in roman language, sorry, what do we mean by a city well exactly that's my point like well, talking, I'm saying I'm actually I'm asking like I'm asking what you mean by a city. Well, it, it it really depends on what theorists you're deploying and what they're assuming is is the essence of what a city is. But that's important because the conditions of of what makes up a city uh, is going to be downstream from what you determine that to be. It's kind of obviously, um, this isn't a city. Uh, there's an argument for um, elements of this representing like the the herbs of of a Roman city. Um, a Roman city is, is a, the idea of a city there is actually closer to uh, the idea of a, a, a polis or a politeia, but a bit more dispersed. Um, the, like, what are we looking at here? Like this, this is, these are, these, these, these are temple pyramids. These aren't dwellings. There's no, like, are we looking at an agora? Are we looking at, like, a market square? It might might be a market square, or something like a market square. Like, if the argument is just large-scale dwellings require uh, certain administrative structures, uh, inevitably, yeah, there's probably a case there. But Actually, the what are we... Sorry. Uh, what is this? My apologies, I'm... My, like, I'm right. using my phone, so I can't really see that well. Uh... I want to say like a Mayan thing, maybe Incan. I don't know. My my. That's that's definitely not Incan. It's definitely not Incan. Oh, yeah, absolutely not. The fuck. It's not. That's not. Per, it's not Peru or Chile or Bolivia. And that doesn't really seem Mayan. That's probably Aztec. Or sorry, not. Aztec, but, but most um, Aztec dwellings weren't like this, though. Tenochtitlan land is sort of an aberration. Um, like I'm looking at the geography, and I'm, I'm, hang on, hang on a second, give me a moment. This may actually be my end. Hang on. Oh, let's see. That could, that could, no, hang on, hang on, dude. Look, when I, when I Google, uh, Incan Step Pyramid. Oh, give me a second here. Let's go. I think that's the Temple of the Feathered Serpent. Wait. Hang on. No, that's... Yeah, that's the Temple of the Feathered Serpent. So I think that is Aztec. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hang on, hang on. I just want to... I, I want to... I want to see what an Incan pyramid looks like. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That's Teotihuacan. Civilizations like the Olmec, Maya, Aztec, and Inca all built pyramids to house their deities. That could have been Mayan. I don't think so. Usually, I mean, I'm not, I'm not like a huge expert on it, but usually they're a lot taller, um, and they're a lot more narrow. That's like the little things that I keep in mind when I. But again, I'm looking at this from. I mean, I have great eyes, but this is on my little phone, and I can't see it that well. Just like a like a '90s TV detective. Sorry. You're looking at uh, a 14th century Aztec temple 
idiots. I, I don't know. Also, that doesn't really look like. No, I'm not. Also, I'm not Mexican, nor have I been to much of Mexico. Sadly, I think Mexico is a beautiful country. Um, that doesn't really look like the Yucatan. Fair enough. For egalitarian cities, and I hope it's true. Well, then that has some really exciting implications. If it's true. I've already seen at least one reviewer pointing out a bunch of holes in Graeber and Wengo's presentation of that issue, but I don't have much to say about it one way or the other because I just don't have enough knowledge in that field. As much as I want to believe their stories about egalitarian cities, I am somewhat skeptical of whatever they say because of how badly they mangle those topics that I do know something about. Oh, is this... Actually, um, let, me, let me make a little plug here real quick. Uh... On that particular topic and on that particular city, um, wait, was it? Let me look at the. I thought this channel had an episode on that. Oh yeah, here we go. Um, <clears throat> I highly recommend the channel Ancient Americas, uh, which is very well sourced, if I remember correctly. Um, talks a lot about uh, pre-Columbian, you know, pre-colonial, uh, you know, Americas, obviously. And there is an episode on Teotihuacan, uh, which does go into this discussion and more or less like why there's this topic about like, why do people talk about like it being an egalitarian or whatever? Um, and of course, keep in mind, like, usually how that's found is primarily through. Uh, and this is kind of why I don't like them making the point about they're definitely not being administ uh, administrators or like administration because <clears throat> yeah, there wasn't exactly anything to point to class society because uh, we don't have like, you know, large monuments or large estates for whoever these, this ruling class would be. Um, there could very well be administers for uh, like public, some sort of like a, uh, um whatever like public works that there were because keep in mind like as far as i understand i'm pretty sure teotihuacan um was had multiple uh uh there's evidence for basically there being multiple districts which had a uh, different um ethnic groups so you'd have some people that were from like you know baja some people that were from more down south like they could be from yucatan and they were very like ethnically diverse so, I mean, these, and they dealt in different uh, commodities such as like pots and probably like ropes and textiles and stuff like that, which they most likely traded um, or gifted. And that gets to a whole other subject. Um, keeping that in mind, I would be surprised if there was like a lot of competition between these groups. And if they all like shared the same area, that would have to lead probably to some kind of administration. To, you know, what we yeah, have today, well, they, they give they give the I Inuit case. Like they give the Inuit that. case in the I'm third chapter. That. I think we're losing you a little bit there. Oh, we're losing me. Okay, am I good now? Yeah, you're good now. Well, I mean, I was just gonna. I was saying okay. like, they they I, they even like again, Graver and Wengrow specifically have like that case that you cited, which is very useful. The the Inuit case where they. They're they're showing precisely that indeed there there were rigid administrative structures. They were just, um, they were provisional, right? Like it was you you made a shift towards those in in at specific times of scarcity, when you absolutely needed them. Um, sorry, I was laughing before. I wasn't laughing at anything you were saying. It's just when you said Baha, for some reason my brain went to that Orson Welles thing. Where it's like Baha the French. It's like, just... Yeah, <laughs> Baha um, the French. But yeah, I think that channel. That channel is very useful because it does go into, um, like, it also afterwards there's Hohokam and there's even Kahokia and, like, all these different, uh, what is it, um, all these different, like, uh, archaeological sites that show, like, these larger scale societies that worked off of the very different forms of subsistence that we're used to. And um, it's fascinating to see how, like, they possibly are, like, what we can speculate on uh, how they worked. So, yeah, I don't think it's very obvious. And I think that's kind of, I think that's kind of a point that what is politics is kind of having a problem with, it seems. I don't know. Because it seems like what is politics here is, 
is being pretty critical of this whole idea that Teotihuacan is is a um, egalitarian, and maybe like the source the sourcing wasn't as great. Well, actually, no, there was no brought bring up of Teotihuacan. Um, wait, was there in in Dawn of Everything? At least in the chapter, the first three chapters, there wasn't. Um, well, there was bringing up like cities being collectivized, so most likely there there was. Um, but from what I've seen, which hasn't been a lot, again, I'm a hobbyist when it comes to uh, anthropology. It, it seems like there isn't much evidence. You're, you're a Wahhabist of being when it comes society. to anthropology. That's interesting. I'm a Wahhabist. Yes, absolutely. All right, it's almost midnight. Let's call it. We're about halfway well, it's through. It's two thirty-eight for me. It's what? It's two thirty-eight for me. Oh, good God! Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, we need to we need to stop before you before you pass out. We'll we'll pick this up again another day, probably very soon. Um, earlier, I think. But uh, yeah, sounds good. Hopefully, thanks, Bunny Tooth, for coming on, and um, thanks everybody for watching. And uh, what the hell? You're not you're not super chatting me. How am I going to keep the lights on? I'm doing the Chud Logic thing, because apparently that works. All right, thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Take care. Good night. All right, thanks, Bunny Tooth. How are you doing?